From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility <laughs> and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know <laughs> that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. <laughs> <laughs> However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. And therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day <laughs> with tears <laughs> oh. now i commit you to god and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Our brothers and sisters at church, sometimes we get closer to than our own family, it seems. And such was the case in this story. Welcome to Acts, our journey through the fifth book of the Bible that covers the history of the early church, the people, the disciples, his apostles, as they took up his mission after his ascension and receiving the Holy Spirit, 
and spread the gospel throughout their part of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but might have everlasting life. And in fulfilling that promise, God sent his son to the eastern part of the Roman Empire, highlighted in red there on the world map. And there he established a beachhead for his kingdom and a kingdom on earth that is coming and yet it is here. It is increasing and yet it is not yet. We're living in that era even now, between the now and the not yet. And from the Roman Empire, the gospel is continuing to be spread around the world. You're in this room today because someone shared the gospel with you. So our story today is Acts 20, verse 17 through 38. Paul is returning home from his third missionary journey. He's returning back to Syria. He makes a stop in what's now known as Turkey, called Asia at that time, Asia Minor. And he stops in Miletus, about 30 miles from a church that he spent three years establishing. And the leaders of that church came to see him one more time. From Miletus, verse 17, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders or the leaders or the pastors of that church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I also lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And in their town, the Gentiles also gave him grief. Verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, every city that he walks, comes to, the believers there give him words of warning, don't go to Jerusalem, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. And so he's going to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit is leading him to, but all along the way the Holy Spirit is warning him that it's not going to be easy. Verse 25, And indeed now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. This was bad news to them. This is their last chance to see him. Therefore, verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Everywhere I've gone, I have shared the gospel. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So when you see these wolves come in from outside and try to lure you away from the truth, remember, I warn you guys, when you see someone from your own midst, somebody that you love, rises up and tries to cause division, remember, I warned you, verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you, or I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified, those who are set apart for his purposes. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. Paul had a traveling career. He was a tent maker, a leather worker. Wherever he went, he was able to support himself. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. These words aren't in the Gospels. Yet Paul says the Lord said them. 
This is true in one of two ways. One, the Lord himself said them to him. We know he heard the Lord's audible voice, right? Or this is one of those things that John referred to in the end of chapter 20 of John's gospel and the end of 21 that says the Lord said many other things that if they were all recorded, the world couldn't handle all the books. It is more blessed to give than to receive. How is this true? Well, if you receive, often it's because you're in a position of need, right? And if you give, it's because often you're in a position of abundance. So it's not shooting at receiving, but we should be glad to be able to give because you want to be in that other position, right? But don't be too proud to receive when you are in need, all right? Verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. I'm going to speak to you today on the subject, leadership's bucket list. Does anybody have a bucket list? Yvette and I have one. We hope to go back to her homeland, to Zimbabwe, this summertime. It's the, kind of their winter time. Get away from the heat here as well as to revisit where I proposed, revisit where we met, walk that mile-long walk from my house to her house. Things like that we hope to do on our bucket list. What if on your bucket list was to attend a golfing seminar with your favorite golfer? What if you had the opportunity to hear a speaker speak on your favorite subject Someone that you admired. What if you got an opportunity one more time to hear Billy Graham preach the gospel? Would you take advantage of that opportunity? Would you listen closely? This is what happened here. This were the leaders of a church, their last opportunity to hear a man. You reckon they paid close attention. Now, don't sit there and think, this really doesn't refer to me because I'm not a leader. Well, if you are a follower of Jesus then you are someone to follow. So you are a leader, right? If you're a model employee on your job, you are a leader. Even though you may not draw the foreman's salary, you're someone to follow. So this word is for us all. These words of Paul relate to us all. In two of his letters, he writes about the qualifications of leaders and their good qualifications that we all should press toward reaching in our lives. So in this talk are 10 things. I'm going to add a couple more at the end uh, just because I can't help myself. But here's 10 things that are important for the life of believers. It's important that we are committed to continue. Can we say continue? That we not stop. As beautiful as retirement is, you don't retire from leading. You don't retire from following the Lord and being someone for others to follow. Paul had this to say in his talk. Verse 24, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's committed to this cause. He's so committed to this cause that it winds up getting him arrested and he winds up in Rome. But everywhere he's going... He's committed the cause. Whether he's a free man or a prisoner, he still continues. Next point. To be a leader, we must be very teachable. We never stop learning. You ever stop learning, you're in trouble. This was their opportunity. Paul reminded them, I did not hold back. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Does everybody want everything God has for them? So we need to be teachable. Somehow in our culture, Because of the internet, we now have access to all kinds of information. Knowledge is increasing more and more, and the access to it is amazing. But you cannot download wisdom from the internet. Wisdom is taught and it's caught. You need people in your life to pass on the counsel of God, the wisdom of God for your life, which is how to apply all that knowledge and information. I'm thankful for the Internet, a lot of good things about it. Who wants to believe half-truths, right? Who wants to believe a bunch of urban legends and fake news? Always verify stuff before you believe it. Just because it's on the Internet, remember Abe Lincoln said, just because it's on the Internet, it's not true? I saw that on the Internet one time. (laughs) Be on 
guard, on guard. He went on in his talk to say, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The most dangerous member of this church is me. I mess up, it affects a lot of people. The most dangerous person in the ministry of the church that you're a part of is you. The most dangerous person in your company, if you're an entrepreneur, is you. You mess up, man. You've screwed everything up, right? The most dangerous member of your family is you. It's not me. It's, it's you. It's, it's, it's all of us. Whatever we're involved in, we are very important. So that was his first commission to them. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds, that's the word for pastor, of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. We don't own the Lord's sheep. We are shepherds, but he is the chief shepherd. Can I get an amen? He bought us with his blood. Nobody else owns us. The Lord owns us. Be forewarned. Don't go into shock when somebody tries to lead you astray. For I know this, in verse 29 he said, that after my departure, savage wolves, that's what he calls these people, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some false prophet will come to town and try to get all your money and sell you a new anointing times 10 for $2,600. That's on your television. Coming into your home, trying to get you, trying to dupe you. Also from among yourselves, men or women will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, it may appear that someone has a just cause to be divisive. Someone hurt their feelings. Someone did them wrong. But I tell you what, people can be passive-aggressive. Who knows that's true? Passive-aggressive persons will use the victim card to cause all kinds of havoc. You don't believe it? Look at the nation of Israel, the Palestinians, victim card. They don't want to find a solution for peace because that would remove them from being a victim. Victims will try to manipulate you. They'll try to come into a church. Maybe somebody did offend them. Maybe they do have a just cause. But you don't go to the whole church and sow discord with your offense, right? What is all that about? They don't just want to sow discord. They want to draw people to themselves. It's me. It's all about me. I made a video yesterday, I've, I've got to shorten it before I try to show it to you, but in it is a bunch of memes that I found off the internet of things that, are, that people are posting that are what I call me-isms. I did it my way, I got to be me. I deserve to be happy, what about me? It's my way or the highway, it's high time for some me time. If you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. Got to look out for number one. I deserve a break today. YOLO, you only live once. You can have your best life now. I found another meme. I chickened out on sharing it with you. It said, if you're having your best life now, you must be on your way to hell. <laughs> you can do it. Yes, we can. I'm all I got. I'm only human. I am somebody. Hungry? Why wait? Do what you feel like. If it feels good, do it. Do your own thing. I'm doing my thing. I'm okay. You're okay. You have a right to be all you can be. Shakespeare even got in on this. To thine own self be true. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. What is that? We're in a world full of narcissists. And it's creeping in the church all about me. No, it's all about him. Must be he-centered, not me-centered. And then all about others. Loving others as we love ourselves. And even beyond that, loving others as Christ has loved us. So when you see this kind of thing happening, people are drawing disciples after themselves. Sometimes they'll try to draw you away from the gospel to lure you into some kind of cult. We could teach on the cults. But I tell you, what's more important than learning about all the intricacies of the cults is learning all about the kingdom of God and the truth of the gospel. The best way to spot counterfeit money is study 
real money so that when you see counterfeit money, you know something ain't right. When you hear something that's not right, you know it. Kind of like taking your bath with your socks on. Something's not right here. What did I forget? Be reminded. It's one thing to know something. It's another thing to remember what you know. You may have the diploma, but do you remember it enough to apply it in your life? That's why we meet, to remind each other of what we already know. Therefore, watch and remember, verse 31, he said, for three years I did not cease, I didn't stop, to warn everyone night and day with tears. He was passionate about this. Sometimes in youth ministry, Someone comes in to the flock to sow division. And once they've done their job, they leave and say, I'm not coming to this youth group anymore. There's too much drama around here. We do a little investigation, found out they caused it. Be edified. It is important to be encouraged. This is to balance what I said about meisms a while ago. Be edified and receive from the Lord his affirmation for you. And now I entrust you to God, Paul said, the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. How are we receiving an inheritance? Because of our goodness? No, because of his goodness. Because of his grace, we have a hope for the future. Be hardworking. This is not a thing for lazy people. He said, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I mean, Paul had it going on. He didn't have a family, a wife or children to take care of. He was able to devote his whole life to the gospel. So he treated people on his team like they were his family and was the breadwinner for this thing. No wonder he wrote a big part of the New Testament and established so many churches. He was hardworking. It's not for the lazy. Be supportive. He said, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. It's easy in our culture to not care about weak people because we're able to see the reason for their poverty. We're able to see the foolishness in their life. But I tell you what, when when you're down in the dumps, you need a hand, don't you? You need somebody to have mercy on you and be supportive and help you. Some people are weak just because they're weak. And the Bible says the strong should support those who are weak. Be generous. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And finally, be caring for one another. Care about each other. When he said this, these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. He didn't say, folks, I need prayer. There's hard times waiting for me in Jerusalem. And it's all about me. Come on, talk about me. No, he prayed with them all. He cared about them. He cared that they were bawling and squalling, that they weren't going to see him anymore. He was sad too. So they had a good opportunity to pray together. What did he pray when he prayed with them? Well, we have a written prayer for this very church. In Ephesians chapter 3, he said, for this reason... I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Your family gets a name from heaven. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Who wants to receive a prayer like that? Isn't that good? And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Man, what a prayer. I want you to be able to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep the love of Christ is. How wide is his love? Well, his love causes him to forgive us of our iniquities. And the Bible says he removes our iniquities from us as far as the east is from the west. You can't get any wider than that, can you? 
get on an airplane and fly east and tell me when you stop flying east. You'll run out of gas. That's the width of the love of God. You can't measure it. How long is his love? Well, we have his love recorded as beginning at the foundation of the world. Christ was the lamb slain, was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And he kept his love alive all the way to the cross, all the way to you and I, and beyond. His love is not stopping. That's pretty long, isn't it? How high is his love? How deep is his love? His love is so deep that he left the throne room of heaven and descended and humbled himself to become a man and humbled himself as a man to become a a servant and humbled himself as a servant to die the death of a criminal and humbled himself by dying the death of a criminal by going into Hades. That's pretty deep. Why did he do that? How high is his love? It's so high, he left Hades, arose from the dead, and has ascended back to the Father and is coming back again. That's pretty high. His love is wide. His love is long. His love is deep. His love is high. We need to pray for one another that we get a grasp of that truth, that we're able to communicate it to our children, to one another, and to ourselves when we are tempted to forget. Now we venture beyond this talk, just because I couldn't help myself. A leader needs to be an example. Paul told the church in Corinth in his first letter to them, chapter 11, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Can we say that every day? Beyond Sunday morning? Are we living a life that others can follow? And finally, be consistent which takes us right back to continuing. Don't stop. Don't stop. Look at this. From Miletus, there in the, towards the middle of this map, he sails to two other places, and then they pass Cyprus on their left and land in Tyre, and there he does the same thing for seven days. This guy's consistent. We see in the next chapter, verse 3, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlaid, unload her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. See, it's happening again. And we had accomplished those days. We departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. They walked a good distance from the city to tell this man goodbye, wives, children, and men. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Paul is consistent. So for the sake of consistency, I just want to review something I said last week. I spoke on, do you live fully connected to God's people? This is an important question. Do you live filled with the Spirit? Is God's Word increasing in your life? These are three very important questions. Do you live fully connected? We say fully connected to God's people. If not, you're getting ripped off. The Christian life isn't made to be lived alone. It's made to be lived with one another. Not only are you getting ripped off, you're ripping us off because we need your influence in our family. For the sake of being consistent, I want to show a video that I really like that I showed last week. Show it again on loving one another. What does it mean to love one another? Is it an emotion of the heart? An act of service? A force of the will? Can love ever truly be defined? We think so often in simple terms, but real love goes much deeper. It strengthens the weak, helps those in need, lives in harmony with all people, and holds us accountable. Love means carrying each other's burdens, admonishing and instructing, showing compassion and feeling it too, spurring one another to good deeds, confessing and forgiving, building and maintaining trust, being of one mind no matter our differences. Love means accepting others for who they are and allowing ourselves to be changed in the process. So love holds us together, 
grafted by faith into the one true Christ, whose example compels us to love one another. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would grant them according to your riches and glory to be strengthened with might through your spirit in their inner person. And that they would know Christ as dwelling in their hearts through faith. And that they, being rooted and grounded in love, would be able to comprehend with everyone what is the width, length, depth, and height of your love that passes knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. O Lord, you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to your power at work in us. To you be the glory, Lord. We ask you to do these things with us as individuals, and with us as a congregation, and with the congregations in this region and in your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Before we take communion, I want to review something I shared earlier. Acts 20, 28, we was talking to these leaders. He said, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So we belong to God. Who sees that? And one of the metaphors that describes us, one of our names, is we are the body of Christ. This local congregation is one of the expressions in this community of the body of Christ, of which we all are a part. As an individual, I am not the body of Christ, but as an individual, I am part of the body of Christ. As individuals, you are not the body of Christ, but you are the parts in the body of Christ. May we never forget that. And Paul contended for unity between the parts of the body of Christ. And in talking about communion, he begins to talk about the Lord's broken body, represented by the bread, the Lord's blood, represented by the cup, and the Lord's body, his people. He said this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine: 29, if anyone, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing or discerning the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself or herself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. That's a polite way of saying gone to an early grave. What is he saying? Basically, we are ripped off of the benefits provided through the shed blood and broken body of our Lord Jesus when we do not recognize the Lord's body. When we live in division with one another, we do not reap the benefits of his body and blood. Now, some will not take communion. I've seen it. It's as though they believe the communion elements become poison. So I'm not going to partake of communion because I've got all with some people in this church. And they think that gets them off the hook. You know, as long as you don't drink poison, it won't kill you, right? It's not poison. It's life-giving. But it doesn't give life to where there's division. That's the point. So dodging the issue really doesn't dodge the issue. The issue isn't don't take communion. The issue is get things right with people you're at odds with. Well, they offended me. Well, go to them. Well, the Bible says they're to go to me. Yes, it does. But it also says you're to go to them. So the monkey's on everybody's back. I used to have a monkey. They'll get on your back, all right, and not let go of it. So as we distribute the elements, I I just want you to consider. Let's just right now, just, Lord, is there anything in my heart towards someone? Help me to get it right. I don't want anyone abstaining from communion because of this. I want them taking communion because of this. Because we need the benefits of what he provided for us, do we not?
much for your broken body, God. I thank you, Lord, that when you took communion with the disciples on that night, you said, this is my body. Take of it and eat. And do this in remembrance of me. And today we do it in remembrance of you. And we thank you, Lord, that through your brokenness, we are made whole, God. And today, Father, we not only receive this bread as a reminder of our salvation, but we, we receive it as healing in our bodies, Father. Your body was broken for us. And today, by your stripes, we claim that we are healed, Father, in every ailment, body, soul, and spirit, God. established the covenant. You poured out your blood and we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name. 